Before we get started, a word from our friends at Keeley Companies. In the words of Keeley Companies CEO, Rusty Keeley, when it comes down to it, there are two things that make Keeley Companies incredible, people and process. The strategic growth model called the Keeley Way ensures that Keeley achieves results on purpose. Including five-year visions, scorecards, meaningful action plans, the Keeley Way allows Keelians to turn dreams into reality and drives goals to realize visions. Because of this relentless focus on people and culture, Keeley Companies has experienced explosive growth that shows no signs of slowing down. Learn more at KeeleyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book, On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to this episode of the Live Inspired podcast with John O'Leary. We're halfway through our special five-week Live Inspired Electing Gratitude series. It's designed to help you manage the election season that is continuing forward and the beginning of the holidays in the midst of an ongoing pandemic. Today, today you are in for a treat. Does having the world at your fingertips 24-7 ever feel overwhelming? Have you ever noticed yourself mindlessly scrolling through social media for what seems like hours, only to be left with anxiety or frustration, maybe unproductivity, or even isolation. Has screen time affected your relationships, your sleeping habits, your creativity, and a whole lot more than that? Well, today, Tiffany Schlain shares her expertise on the importance of disconnecting from screens for one day for the entire week. She's an expert in this because she was into digital media when digital media was in its infancy. And she knows, my friends, the power of social media, the power of being connected. But the way you ultimately harness that is not to be connected to it all the time, but to pull back from time to time to really refocus of what matters most so that when you re-engage with technology, so that when you re-engage with social media, so that when you re-engage with your screen, you can be far more engaged with your life. You're in for a treat. She is the author of the best-selling book. It's called 24-6. Tiffany has been practicing a weekly tech Sabbath for more than a decade. Yes, even through the midst of a pandemic, she is instilling and ensuring that her teenage daughters do as well. And I think you're going to love in this episode how she shares that not only does she benefits, benefit from this, but so does her spouse and so do those girls. So buckle up because this conversation has ignited a movement in my family and in the families of our organization. After all, what better time than right now to learn actionable steps to reset and rebalance ourselves and our families? So my friends, please join me in welcoming my friend, and now yours. Her name is Tiffany Schlain. Tiffany Schlain, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. You know, I, I wish we were live while we were recording a moment ago, because you and I have already had about a 25-minute conversation about <laughs> life and children and technology and work and money and everything else that uh, might matter to people today. But I'm glad to bring you on to my friends right now. Now we can share it with everyone else. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you have such an awesome resume. You've, you've been everywhere and you've done just about everything. If I were to meet you at a cocktail party in California and I said, hey, Tiffany, what do you do for a living? How would you respond to that question? <laughs> That's such a great question. Great. I could go in a lot of different directions. I would first try to understand who you were before I answered that question. I mean, because it's interesting because I'm always trying to speak to the moment. So... <laughs> Um, I might say to you um, that I'm a filmmaker. I might say that I'm an author. Um, I might say that I'm a mom. <laughs> it really depends. I right. mean, or I might say that I founded the Webby Awards. And, you know, if we're in a tech environment, I, it really, I try to kind of um, meet where I am. I guess that's a good way to answer to that. Because, you know, I think I also... 
I mean, if, if another woman were to ask me that, I think I'm also very sensitive. Like I might not say I'm a mother unless I first find out if they're a mother. You know, it, it's an interesting thing to kind of read a situation to make sure you make people feel as comfortable as possible. And, and one thing that I've been trying to ask a lot when I see people, although I don't see very many people in the pandemic, but I see people mostly that I know very well, which is an interesting thing, except I have a, a new puppy. So that makes me talk to a lot of new people, but we usually talk about dogs. Yes. But I love to say to people at a cocktail party, when we used to all go to cocktail parties is what are you passionate about? Because sometimes that's not what they do. And that's always interesting too. This is a good question. Let me ask it of you. What are you passionate about? Making things happen, bringing important ideas out far and wide into the world, whether it's through film or words or lectures or happenings that I'm very interested in inspiring people, educating, informing, and hopefully lifting them up to a higher place, which is why it's so perfect I'm talking to you. <laughs> Sounds okay. like we have similar aspirations. <laughs> Yes, indeed. So, you know, normally now we move forward or we talk about the book that just came out a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to look a little bit farther back, though. There was a person in your life, several individuals in your life who had a profound influence on your life. And one of them had the first name Leonard. Oh, yeah. I know you made a whole My movie dad. about this gentleman, but he also went by the name Dad. Talk about your dad for a little yeah. bit to our listeners. He was like my own private Einstein, <laughs> but I called him Dad and he was brilliant. And I he really was. I mean, he he was a surgeon and he wrote, you know, three best-selling books and then one that me and my brother and sister got published after he died. Um, but he wrote a lot about the brain. He taught me everything about the brain. He wanted me to be a brain surgeon. Um, he bought me the book, The Making of a Woman Surgeon, four times. And he brought a <laughs> human brain to my fourth grade class in formaldehyde. And I loved learning about the brain and um, from him was a part of my bedtime stories. And I ended up, I made many, many movies about the brain. Um, and he and I were incredibly close. We spoke every day. And um, he also did a lot of speaking and we, we lived very similar lives for, there was a beautiful period in our life where we were both on this planet and we, we often spoke at the same conferences, <laughs> which was very fun. And then tragically, the man who taught me everything about the brain got brain cancer and, um, it was a very quick, painful experience, but not actually beautiful also because he knew so much about the brain, he knew what was happening. So he was very aware of how much time we had left to share everything we wanted to. And then, and then he died and it was like a nine month period. And it was also the same period I, I had, I was going through a pregnancy. So he passed away and my daughter was born within days. So it was a very dramatic moment in my life. And it was actually a moment where I felt like life was really saying, what matters to you, Tiffany? How are you living? How do you wanna live? And that's when my family and I started turning off screens one day a week, which was almost 11 years ago. I'm calling them our tech Shabbats and it's been like the best thing I've ever done in my life. And I think there's a lot of similarities to this moment that everyone's going through in the pandemic where we all were kind of shaken by the shoulders going, what's important, what matters? We had to question, how are we making our living? Yeah. who we're spending our time with, our health, everything, everything that we trusted was suddenly in question, but it helped us reappreciate what was right in front of us, the roof over our head, the people in our home, what really matters. So it, I think these moments of crisis can be incredible opportunities to rethink and make changes in your life. And that his gift to me was showing me how important it is to live fully and, and present for what's happened. He was a very present person, like at his funeral, the most common thing, the most frequent thing people said to me, especially people I didn't know that came to his funeral were like, your dad always made me feel like the most important person in the room. And with the cell phone coming out, kind of right around the time he passed, yes. no one's the most important person in the room because everyone's got that phone right nearby to take you out of the moment. What was the one thing that your father taught you about life? And, you know, There's and I was nothing, like, nothing go, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I hadn't planned on going so deep into your dad's story, but it, it, clearly he had such an effect on you as a child, as a young lady, as a woman, in his illness, in his death, and afterwards. It's, it's shaped your life, and it's probably the reason why you, you and I are talking today. I think it, it, it changed mm. the arc of your journey forward. 
So uh, what was the one thing that dad taught you mattered most? That I was loved and I was seen. And I, I, I'm so grateful for that. I mean, I know so many women that didn't feel that way from their fathers and it has such a reverberation. And I think my confidence as a woman, I'm often the only woman in a tech room or, and, and there's no question that what I'm saying is, I mean, he actually thought women were more powerful. So he gave me, imbued me with this sense of being seen and loved that I think I was asked in this interview for the book tour, somebody was like, well, if there was one thing you could change in the world, what would it be? And of course there was part of me that's like gender equality, the environment. <laughs> democracy. And you know what I came down to is that, that everyone felt loved and seen. And I think so many of our societal issues is what happens when you don't feel loved and seen. And um, I, I just, it was such a gift. And I think about that a lot as a parent. And, you know, I fortunately married someone that also from his mother felt very loved and seen and you know these foundational relationships they just I think it can be fixed if you didn't if you find a, an amazing partner that can kind of love you out of whatever situation you had but just to get very empirical I do think I mean there's lots of other things he taught me like how to live life and how to be passionate and think big and do big things and like take risks but at the core I think it was that being present and loving in a really present way is probably his biggest gift. You mentioned a moment ago, and we're just going to speed through the Webbies and your trip to Russia and everything else that you've done mm -hmm. and your experiences uh, through work. But you mentioned about 11 years ago, John, I lost my, my dad and I birthed my daughter. And these two experiences merged as one was the beginning of a decision we made, uh, you know, essentially a Sabbath on the weekends. Would you explain to me what you meant by that? Yeah, and I, I should say that I'm Jewish, but I'm not a religious person, but I love the rituals. And I, I, I respect anyone that does the Sabbath for religious reasons, but I think what was most exciting to me about doing this practice is that I wasn't coming at it from a religious place. Now, if you are a very observant Christian or Jew, you will take the fourth commandment, a day of rest. It's the fourth, a full day off. It's a, and mostly in today's modern society, only really observant people do that. But what was so exciting to me was that I was, I'm a cultural Jew. I would occasionally light candles on Shabbat. You know, Shabbat is Friday night. But my family and I started like turning off all screens. We were like, we always have people over on Friday night. And it's this wonderful meal. We set the table. We make a lot of special food and it's like this yummy night unlike the other six days which <laughs> like working parents scattershot and um and all the screens are off and they're off for 24 hours and it is literally my favorite day of the week it's about to start in like three hours for me and i had a very stressful week so i'm so excited but i sleep better i read better i think better i have my best best ideas on saturday and i know that because i'm a big journal writer they always come on saturday and i am more present I'm more connected to myself. I feel like I'm the best mother, the best wife that day. You know, the other, it makes up for some of the other days, but it's just the day that I feel like I return to myself and I get completely replenished. And the longer we, we started doing this practice, the more addicted everyone became. And this is like way before the pandemic. Totally. And, uh, and that's when I decided, like when I was kind of approaching 10 years of doing it, I thought, oh my God, this is like the secret sauce of life and I need to share it. So I started writing the book and then the book came out last year and then the pandemic hit and it's like, oh my gosh, the technology was accelerated in everyone's life so much. Now school, social, work, everything's online and people are burning out on such a deep soulful level. And um, it's been really exciting during the pandemic to share the book. Um, you know, so many people are now doing this practice and then the paperback came out. So it feels like it'll reach a whole new audience that would only buy a paperback and not a hardcover. And it's just, it's such a simple, ancient wisdom to bring into your life that is so deep. And the longer I do it, the deeper it becomes and the more benefits come from it. Um, but it's just the best thing I've ever done in my life. I'm 50 this year. And I'm like, you asked me the one thing my dad taught me, if you said, what's the greatest thing you've learned in your life, it would be that this practice will be the, the, the rhythm and the framework to live a good life.
So in a moment, I want to talk about the benefits of, of living this type of good life, of being highly intentional with what you say yes to and what you also say no to. But first, mm -hmm. let's just talk about technology. I think all of us are aware that we have phones and computers and mm -hmm. Skype calls and Zoom calls and everything else, but we're not... I don't think completely aware to the degree that it has control over our lives and then the effect of that control in our lives. So scare us for a moment, wake us up for a moment, Tiffany, tell us what technology is doing to us. Well, it's manipulating the way that we're behaving. And I think that the social dilemma documentary on Netflix is a really good film for people to see to kind of walk you through that it was a whole bunch of young guys yeah. <laughs> that were creating these tools without a lot of forethought on what it might do but it's like harvesting data about your behavior and manipulating you and the business model is to keep our eyes glued to the screen at every second and it's it's working and and they drip notifications to you so you post something on social media they know how many pings to let you know so you'll keep coming back let's say you got 50 at once they might not tell you that 50 at once they're going to drip them out to you to just keep come you coming back like an addict for more and it is designed to make you in a constant state of want, like you're never getting enough. So you'll be on more and you'll get more things to be sold to you on the advertisement. So when I founded the Webby Awards, when I was in my 20s, that was not the vision of the web. It was this utopian nonprofit utility for everyone to connect and share ideas and create. And then, um, you know, corporations came in, like we're going to make money from this. It's like the Wild West. And they did. And now we're all... The product we are all being used and manipulated now there's lots of incredible benefits of sure. the web right now during the pandemic just as all like take a moment and imagine the pandemic without the web we could not be having this conversation you could not be working it would you wouldn't get all the information about covid it would just change so many things so there's so many great things and i think that's the interesting place i lie i'm not anti-social media i'm not anti-technology i'm just about being intentional and to take a full day each week break and you will really see it in a different way and see the power of it and the manipulation of it. And it lets you kind of reset every week and gives you the perspective that I think most of us don't have because you're just constantly sucked into the network for the next stressful news headline, the next email, the next notification. You just like wake up, go to bed, you're looking at that thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna slowly warm the pool water before I, I I push people off the diving board into the deep end of taking a 24 hour reprieve. Tell me about some of the things you do intentionally during the week to to be in charge of your device rather than the, the device being in charge of your life. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a whole section in the book that I really go into the other six days. Cause actually the tech Shabbat is the easiest day of the week to clear my head. Cause it's just, it's in a drawer. I mean, I literally, the phone isn't near me and I love that clarity. That's like out of sight, out of mind. I'm like, you know, when I said that you're in a constant state of want on the web, when I turn it off, it's like this immediate switch of just appreciating what's right in front of me. I suddenly am like, Oh, the garden, my cat, my daughter's smile, that whatever. It's like, I'm suddenly so quickly switched from want to appreciation. Wow. It's amazing. So just for that alone. But the other six days, I've done all these little interventions to create boundaries. And, and you know, the exciting thing about technology at the early days of the web is it removed every boundary. And you could work from anywhere, you could do anything, but I don't think that's necessarily a good thing as we're seeing like, you need boundaries. Boundaries are good. Boundaries can set you free, actually. And um, some of the boundaries I do during the week are when I wake up, I use my phone as my alarm clock. That It's on airplane mode, though. I wake up, I go downstairs, get my coffee, I sit in my cozy chair, put a blanket over me, and I write in my five-minute journal. So I don't, I'm not looking at the news, I'm not letting the news set my day, I'm not letting email set my day or social media. I think about what am I grateful for? What, is, what can happen today? And there's only three lines. What are three things you're grateful? What are three things that you hope will happen today? And makes you think about your day. And then I go on. After that, I've said that I go on. And then I go on, look at the news of the world. And the whole world rushes into my brain. Right. But then Hope before I go to bed, yeah, I go to, before I go to bed, I do that same ritual where I'm in bed now. And I have that journal. And it says, what are three amazing things that happened today? And what's one thing you wish you did differently? So a little reflection, too. I'm telling you, starting and ending the day with my own thoughts instead of the world's thoughts is so profound. Um, and then the other one we do is at dinner and just dinner, no, no screens at the table. And we, that's the only meal we all eat together. And it's just like a 30 minute experience, but like, let's be present. 
So those are, but I have a lot more in the book that I talk about these little things I do, you know, cause I, you know, I also love, like I just released a book on paper. I've got a new film coming out. I also love the power of being able to release things on the web. Totally. You have two children. Many of our listeners are mothers, fathers, aunts, uh, guardians. They're raising their own kids or they love people who are raising kids. What are yeah. some tools or tips that you would recommend for those of us who are uh, in a period of, of loving a child through that stage in their life? Well, we weren't designed to be this on. I mean, I think we as adults and certainly not a developing brain. And my 17 year old daughter just says it so eloquently. I'm just like, she look, she, she, did, she loves the day, the texture box because she doesn't want to feel like she has to respond so much. Hmm. And when there's a couple times a year, like this weekend, she's part of Junior State of America, which is like this student run thing. And she's not gonna be able to get a texture bar. And she's already told me she's bummed that she's not gonna get a day off. Cause she feels like she doesn't get that break. And she, she's always said texture bots feel like they protect her from burnout, you know, cause she's applying to college this year. It's very stressful. And then our 11 year old daughter, I would say that we should, parenting is so much modeling behavior. So they're looking to us. So. The other great thing about TextureBot is you're all putting the screens away. Because a lot of times you'll say, oh, my kids are on screens, but they're looking at us on screens. But sometimes my daughter will say, oh, I'm bored. That mm -hmm. will happen. And I, I always am like, oh, my gosh, that's the runway to creativity. <laughs> I'm like, we want to teach our kids to have to entertain themselves. That it's just too easy to pick up the phone and play a game, go on TikTok, go on whatever, and be, watch a YouTube video, be entertained. But it's a really important skill to have your child and ourselves just be with yourself. I mean, every great wisdom practice is ultimately about being able to quiet, quiet the noise and hear your inner wisdom that is usually too noisy to hear. So we need to teach our kids that it's okay to just be with yourself mm. and it might be a little uncomfortable and then push through that. And it's going to be fantastic. And it's a great skill. One of the things we need, you know, we teach them empathy and generosity and courage and social intelligence, but also just being comfortable with being with yourself is a very valuable skill to learn how to do. And a very rare skill learned these days. I think most of us are right. very uncomfortable and unfamiliar with ourselves. So let, let's talk about your tech Shabbat. Friday nights, we're going to we're gonna have a dinner party. Talk, talk about that. <laughs> okay, so it starts Friday morning because I make fresh bread every... I make challah, which is an incredible yummy bread that actually during the pandemic, I do these Zoom challah bakes where I have hundreds of people from all over the world that bake. That I lead, teach them how to bake and I have guests and it's very fun. Um, and people can join me on that. So I make this bread and it's part of the beginning of the ritual that happens Friday morning because you have to put your hands in dough. It's very meditative to make bread. It rises all day. I usually will send a reminder Friday afternoon to our guests because we still have people coming but just outside at a distance and I'll say, just warm and uh, any dietary restrictions. And just a reminder, no cell phones at our texture bot dinner. <laughs> Everyone is, it's, it's, a, it's not a novelty for them, but it, just a reminder. And um, it's always such, it's my favorite conversation of the week. It's just, it's just, I laugh more. The conversation goes into really intimate and beautiful places. We talk about what's happening in the week. It's always just super fun. And there's no kids table and adults table. It's one table and I use conversation cards that we all, it's one conversation and it's really wonderful. And then um, I also have a glass of wine that night. I, I don't, and I don't drink during the week. So it's like, and you know, I have ice cream. I have all the like sweets I don't have during the week. And then, uh, so the kids love it. Cause it's like really good meal. We'll often invite our friends' families over, like our kids, like their best friends' parents. Yes. So we get to know them that way, which is really nice. So it's not, oh, this is something I have to do. This is like a dinner party every week where we're bringing either family and friends that are close or new people or families of our kids' friends over to get to know them, which I think is a really nice thing to do. When you so share with them, let me pause you there just for a moment. When you share with them, oh, by the way, leave your cell phones at home. Leave them mm -hmm. on airplane mode. Do not even think for a moment about grabbing this and bringing it up at the dinner mm -hmm. table. What is the response most of these adults or kids feel about that? I think everyone welcomes it. It's kind of like, wow, it's exciting. And they will always say, what a great, they were so present. You know, you don't realize how much people have their phones in their hands. It's buzzing in their pockets. It's on the table. I go into some research. I have a lot of neuroscience and just like psychological research in the, phone, in the book. And even having a phone off on a table next to your desk, you will be less focused. Just by visually seeing it, a phone turned down, you won't be 100% there. You're like, when's that going to be? Should I check the phone? 
And at my film studio before the pandemic, I used to have a rule of phones tucked into your bag because they're so distracting. So I think everyone, uh, I mean, most people that know me know I do this, but um, if they don't, I think it's welcome because people, I think people wanna be told to put it away. I think everyone's pretty burnt out right now. So last night there was a little disagreement, we'll leave it at that word for now, between my freshman in high school and his mother, my wife. Uh, <laughs> and the phone eventually came out of his pocket into her hands. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's made it back into his hands or pocket subsequently, <laughs> but we stole his joy last night, man. We, we took his life from him last night. I'm, I'm curious, your daughters now have been experiencing Friday nights with you, and that's going to lead ultimately into Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, the entire time mm -hmm. without, a, without a phone. What is their response to this? Right. Well, it's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because it is, we just used a punishment of the iPad for our, one of our daughters and it is a good, you know, it does work because that they want that the most. It really, I'm curious how it went with your son, because I find that the, we haven't done it very often. It will be one evening we're like, your iPad's going away. Yeah. And it was interesting because it was so profoundly important to them that it felt like a consequence. And I think that's ultimately what we need as parents. These are the boundaries. This is what you cross. This is what you can and can't do. And that's our role as parents. But, you know, we have this day on Saturday. Um, you know, I mentioned the Friday night, then I sleep the best on Friday night. Saturday, I do a lot of writing. Then the kids wake up. We kind of do a mixture of everything, nothing, cook, read, go for a walk, nap, play a board game, swim. It's like a very quiet day it's more inward where friday night's very social saturday is about like last saturday i just hung out and talked to my daughters for a couple hours ken was like building something with like with my, one of my daughters and it, it has a really like quiet but wonderful feeling to it but then at 5 p.m saturday night that's when we go back online they're psyched to go back on and my <laughs> husband and i are psyched to go out on a date and leave the house <laughs> and like it's a win-win there everyone's happy but um and it helps you kind of reappreciate technology all over again on, on saturday night but they're psyched to go back on it, but I think it has this dual effect where we can't wait to go off of it and it has this very different feeling all day. And then we can't wait to go back on it. But I think the thing with your son and using it as a punishment, which it also, that's very real, but the tech Shabbat, and I do go into this in the book, it has to really be framed as a gift. Totally. And the way that I suggest doing that, if you want to bring this into your lives, do you have everyone in the family? If you have kids, if you don't have kids, like everyone should write a list of what they wish they had more time to do. Cause you don't realize how much screens actually takes away from when you're actually trying to do something. And when you were younger, what brought you joy and what, and, and make the day filled with a kind of a combination of everybody's list. Mm. So it becomes the most fun day. I mean, we're eating all the foods we don't normally get to eat. We're doing all these things that we want to do that we don't normally get to do. So it has a very different feel to it the day. And there's so much neuroscience research that backs up that it's really good to put your mind in a different mode. That's why, you know, back pre pandemic, like weekend retreats or, you know, something where you're in a completely different environment and you're doing different things is very great stimulation for your brain. And right now we're just like on the devices all the time. We never detach, we never get that perspective and our brains literally need it there's this mode this this neuroscience called um about the brain when it's not actively doing something called the default mode network and it's basically it's your mind making connections with what's already in there so it's why you have your best ideas in the shower doing the dishes on a walk it's because there's so much magic that can happen to your brain when you kind of don't give it new input and just let it do its thing. And right now we're just living in a state where we're constantly giving it new input all the time. I worry about that for all of us. I worry about it in particular for kids in the book and in the, one of the videos that you created called, uh, I think it's called Dear Students, anxiety, depression, and suicide, I believe you said and wrote have more than doubled. And it's in direct correlation to when the iPhone came out and when social media took off and when our attention turned from this freedom of play and creativity and, and being calm to being always on and always connected and always wondering how someone else feels about them rather than how they feel about themselves. Would you talk about that for a while? Why, whether it's the neuroscience or the soci sociology around this, why do we have this need through technology to be, to be connected to those around us? Yeah, I mean, I think it's that beginning question. It makes us feel loved and seen. It's also primal why we need to feel connected to the phone. But I think the problem is, is that 
it doesn't always have the same feeling and meaning when you're not really in person. Although I'll have to say the pandemic has been like a lifeline to so many people. So it's this interesting moment where um, I feel like tech Shabbats are like 10 times more important during the pandemic because we're on them so much more. But I also see the value. I, I was getting very worried about social media before the pandemic. And then it's been this wonderful way to stay connected. So I think it's all about intentionality. Like just be very careful with what, who and what you let into your brain and give your brain breaks. That's what all the stuff that I've learned from my father and all the films I've made and all the researchers I've talked to, treat your brain like the finest piece of technology ever created. And, and it's you and you're the curator and be mindful and careful about what you're exposing it to all the time and know that it needs a true day off every week and it needs breaks throughout the day. You mentioned that this might be easier to do if you're if you're by yourself in your own apartment. It's it's more complicated to do if you have a partner or a spouse, and it's even more complicated if you bring children to bear. So t- talk to our listeners who have a family around how they might be able to not make this a punishment. It's not a punishment yeah. Friday night through Saturday afternoon, but a gift. How do we have that conversation? How do we get there together? Yeah, I go into that a lot in the book. Right now I'm working with a hundred families that are doing four weeks in a row of it. And it's really, I think I would frame it as this cool experiment you're gonna do. It's a challenge, like an experiment that you're gonna do as a family. And I think that's really key is that you're doing this together and you make it fun. And I go into a lot in the back of the book kind of resources, how to make it fun. But I think positioning it as something that is gonna bring a lot back into our lives is a really wonderful way to position it. Also, you, you write quite a bit in the book about the power of silence and reflection. Why, why yeah. is that so powerful? Well, there's research that you need at least two hours a day of silence just for the hippocampus to like regenerate new cells. And I think that we're living in a society that's about optimizing every second. Like we listen to a podcast as we're on a run and we listen to the news in the shower and we're talking. I mean, now, after I read that, I take a walk and I think, nope, I'm not going to listen to a podcast. I'm not going to call anyone. I'm just going to take a walk. <laughs> I get into the shower. I'm like, this is magic hour. Just take a shower. <laughs> and just to like realize that there's a lot of magical things that will happen if you give yourself space for silence and a break. Tell, tell me about your involvement with Wait for Great, Wait for Eighth. What, what, is, what is the idea behind that and why does it matter? Oh, that's an interesting question. So with our older daughter she was like the only one that still had a flip phone in high school she we eventually got her a smartphone which I don't think they should be called smartphones when she was I think it was like December of her freshman year Um, and then our younger daughter there was a whole group of parents that signed a pledge uh, called wait until eighth and it's about wait until eighth grade to get a smartphone Yes. And I'm on the advisory board for that. And we got our fifth grader, a very nice looking flip phone, much nicer looking than my other daughter's flip phone. Cause they actually look a little bit cooler now, but you know, I have to say then the pandemic hit and, and some of the parents that signed that pledge did get their kids smartphones or give them. And it, it's, I'm wrestling with that right now because I still believe, you know, she's got an iPad, which in some ways an iPad is like a big smartphone. And I only realized that like a year ago, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's just like a big iPhone, (laughs) you know, because it does all the same things. But I think it is something about when she's out and about and when she finishes class on Zoom all day, she's psyched at like 1.30 to go out with her friends and be outside, which is I think a blessing of, there's many blessings of the pandemic. That's one of them is she's so happy to be outside. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that she doesn't also have a phone when she's outside. She's got a flip phone that can't do much. So this organization is about a pledge. Like you're gonna wait until eighth grade to get your kid a smartphone, which I think is a really good idea. And I think the pandemic has just changed what those conversations are because it's just it's different but we're still waiting until she's in eighth grade so she's in sixth grade um but there there was a moment where i'm like you know it's all about just trying to keep our kids have a childhood longer right and just not have to be online so much so in preparing for the conversation today, I feel like I've listened to every podcast you've ever been on and watched just about every morning. <laughs> oh my gosh. Been on. So this is awkward because <laughs> I know more about you than you may know about yourself, Miss Tiffany. 
But I, <laughs> one of the last things I watched in preparing yesterday was a morning show you were on and, and clearly they were coming out of the commercial, but like they were still talking about the impact that your conversation had on them. And they were still mm -hmm. talking about, gosh, it, it really would be a good idea for us to do this. And then they flipped mm. into sports and then into weather. And then they for, probably, <laughs> many of them, if we're being honest about it, reached into their purses, reached into their pockets and forgot all about Tiffany and all about 24-6 mm. and all about the challenges mm. of technology, but also how we can be liberated to own the technology. And so as we get ready to wrap up this podcast and send our listeners on their merry ways, I don't want that to happen. I, I don't want them to get busy. I don't want them to do the next thing and, and just forget all about this. I want them to take action and be liberated. Yeah. I really do. This is not entertainment. It's transformation. So help us go from being inspired to, uh, to mm. maybe read a book or maybe, uh, oh, I like her story. Good for her raising those kids that way. Yeah, I guess to I really would say, yeah, I would, I hear you. And, you know, it, what's been exciting is that the book came out last fall and you know i'm on instagram and twitter and there's so many people post shots holding the book and saying this has changed my life so i will say that the book so many people if you just go uh actually to my the book's website 24 6 life and i it, 24 are the numbers and i spell it s-i-x life i have a page of just reader testimonials because it's so stunning to see people from all different walks of life different ages different ethnicities holding up this book and saying it changed their life. So I guess that speaks more than any of the reviews I got, like just yeah. people, it's changed their lives. But sometimes, you know, I'll read a book and it just moves me a little bit over to the left, it moves me a little bit over to this, think twice before I do that. So I would say, I would love for your listeners to get the book. It's an easy read. It has, you know, my personal story, but I have a lot of the why in there and a lot of things that will help convince maybe your partner to read the book. A lot of people will hand it to their wife or husbands will hand it to their, you know, back and forth. Um, so I really, I, I loved writing this book. I loved the response. It's meant so much to me. And I love that it's out in a cheaper version right now just to reach more people. That's awesome. But I will also say, you know, and I do a newsletter and I'm constantly like in different ways sharing this message. Um, but I, I do a lot of other things. I was kind of surprised that this was my first book. I always wanted to make a book about, it'll be my next book, but I was surprised this was my first book, but it felt so important to share this idea. Um, but the other thing I would say is that what's the worst thing that can happen? Like, why not try it? It's free, it's simple. It could be the best thing you do in your life. <laughs> it could be the thing that brings it all back together. So what you know a lot of people are scared of turning off the phone i think they think that the phone has all the power that's connected to everything but you have the power there's so much wisdom and and things that you have that we're just ignoring by always going to the phone for all of our energy mm. Tiffany, as we get ready to wrap up and move into the Live Inspired 7, I am looking at my clock. It's 3.54 in the great state of Missouri in the city of St. Louis. On a Friday. That's where my puppy's from. My puppy's from St. Louis. <laughs> okay, you, sorry. Your puppy's from a wonderful place. Bring your puppy home at some point. Back to Missouri, man. We, got, we, we, we could always use more puppies here. But I, I, I'm gonna, I, I will take the challenge this weekend. I'm going to inspire my kids to view this not as a punishment, but as a blessing. And I can't wait to see what it does over the next 24 hours. So I really do appreciate you challenging us and certainly challenging me. And I give that same encouragement to our listeners to not just be moved to um, think, wow, I'm glad she did that, but to imagine what it might mean for you in your life. And so my friend Tiffany, as we move into the, f the finish line together, uh, seven questions that tether all of our great guests begin with question number one, in addition to the book 24-6. What is the best or most impactful book you've ever read? Uh, that answer would be so different at different stages in my life. But I think when I read Siddhartha when I was in high school, I was really moved by that. That's such a good question. Oh, my God. I might just need to sit here for three hours and yeah. think about that question. <laughs> I don't know if that can be rapid fire, but that's what I'll say right now. And you're right. It, depending on where you are, you just lost your dad and you need a different book. You just had a daughter. You need yeah, a different book. Exactly. Out, balancing two little girls, you need a different book. And so it is a exactly. matter of at what time are you talking about? But Siddhartha yeah. is one that we've had, I think, three different guests call Is out. that right? Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that book really, 
yeah it really it was the first book i read about a whole philosophy of thought and yeah. eastern thought which has always really spoken to me what is one positive characteristic or one trait that you possessed as a little girl that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly <laughs> today Huh. I thought you were going to go in different directions. My mom used to call me Miss Enthusiasm, but I still think I have a lot of enthusiasm. So, <laughs> um, I think I'm pretty, I think I have a lot of the same qualities that I had when I was a girl. But that's another good one to think about. These are perfect things for me to think about on my texture pile. <laughs> you can have Caesar okay, at the yeah. dinner table tonight with your new group of friends. Yeah. All right. So the book, the characteristic, give me one characteristic outside of enthusiasm. What else might it be? That I don't have anymore? Not that you don't have it anymore, but when you were little, it just, oh man, you exuded this one characteristic and yeah, through time and challenge and being a little bit more. Well, I think I used to laugh all the time. Now I really only laugh like on my text bot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I, I wish I made more space. I love laughing so much. And I, as a kid, I was always laughing. Totally. Uh, we need to create space to laugh more. Tiffany, if your home caught fire and all living things, whether they be puppy dogs, husbands, or kids are out and you have an opportunity to run back inside and grab one item that really matters to you, what's the one thing you would grab? Yeah, my photo albums, photo albums, yeah. My dad's watch. Your dad's watch. It's broken. It's been 4 p.m. for 11 years. I don't care. I love that watch. It's going to be on time in about two hours and three minutes. <laughs> if you sure. could sit on a bench on a perfect California day and have a long conversation with anybody living or dead, who would you like to be seated next to? My dad. What would you? I would love to talk to him about, oh my God, the country right now and everything that's happened since he left. Oh my goodness. I mean, I do have these conversations in my head, but it would be very fun to kind of unpack it all. What's the best advice dad or anybody else ever gave you? My mom, she's a psychologist and she always says, enjoy the process. It's all process. All of life is process. So don't try to get to the finish line because it's all in the process. So enjoy all the stages of wherever you are. What would you tell your 20 year old self? Be patient. <laughs> I was very impatient with doing everything I wanted to do. And often the things in my head didn't come out in the way I hoped when I was that young. And as I've gotten older now, they finally do. And just to have patience with the creative process and mm -hmm. getting older and wiser. Tiffany Shalane, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? Turn off screens one day every week to enjoy life to the fullest. <laughs> Tiffany Shalane for 11 years and counting turned off the screen for one day a week to enjoy her life to the fullest and then taught a group of individuals, myself included, how to do likewise in their life. <laughs> Tiffany, I really thank you for uh, making that decision 11 years ago and, and challenging us to make it today. Oh, it has been such a pleasure. I wish we lived near each other. I'd have you over for Shabbat because you're amazing and I want. I wish I could do the same questions right back to you. So maybe we'll get the opportunity someday. I look forward to it. Maybe on a Friday night meal. Oh, that would be so great. I will right, well, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for making ours, my friends. That is Tiffany Schlein. She's the author of Twenty Four Six. My name is John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired. And now. A word from our friends at Keeley Companies. What started in 1976 as a local paving company has grown into a national provider of construction, infrastructure, wireless, technology, development, and logistic solutions. Over four decades and 1,800 Keelians later, Keeley Companies' roots still guide them. In the words of their founder, Larry Keeley, quality and service never go out of style.